geologists are coming, as they're trudging down the hill. When they say that mountains and they're talking 10 to 20 mil, they're classifying rocks from destruction to rebirth. The geologists are coming, they're converging on the earth. Hello. Welcome back. Let's read another chapter of our geology book. Yay! We're on chapter 7. Here we go. Chapter 7, Earth's Powerful Forces of Change. The big question, how do weathering and erosion continually reshape Earth's surface? Have you ever dodged a pothole while riding your bike? Or skidded on grit that rain had washed in your path? Potholes and grit might seem like little more than bike riding hazards, yet they are evidence of two powerful forces at work. Weathering and erosion, as you read in Chapter 6, are processes that drive the rock cycle. They break down rock into sediments and then move them to new locations. Together, weathering and erosion are slowly but steadily reshaping Earth's surface. They are changing everything from the streets and neighborhoods and towns to the world's tallest mountains. Weathering at work. Weathering breaks rock into smaller pieces. Some of these tiny pieces combine with once living material to form topsoil. Other small pieces of rock collect as sediments. This breakdown of rocks happens as they interact with air, water, and living things. There are two basic types of weathering, physical weathering and chemical weathering. Physical weathering breaks big rocks into smaller ones without changing the material, the minerals they contain. Widely swinging temperatures cause physical weathering. For example, rocks in a desert bake during the day beneath the sun's scorching heat. As rocks get hot, they expand. At night, temperatures in the desert fall. As rocks cool down, they contract or shrink slightly. Expand, contract, expand, contract. These this endless cycle gradually causes the rock's outer layer to crumble or flake off. Water also causes physical weathering. Water seeps into tiny cracks in rocks. If temperatures drop below freezing, the, weather, the water turns to ice. Water expands as it freezes, pushing outward and enlarging the cracks. Geologists call this process ice wedging. Each time the water freezes, it opens cracks a little wider. Eventually, the rocks split apart. Ice wedging is what makes potholes in streets, too. <laughs> Plants and animals also cause rocks to weather. Tree roots squeeze into the cracks in rocks. As the rocks grow, they act like wedges, forcing the cracks wider and wider. Eventually, the rocks break apart. Badgers, chipmunks, and other animals burrow into cliffs and hillsides like tiny bulldozers. As they dig or tunnel into the ground, they push buried rocks to the surface where most weathering takes place. I think that's a, a badger. <laughs> Chemical weathering breaks down rocks by changing the minerals they contain. Rain is a powerful chemical weathering force. As rain falls, it mixes with the gas carbon dioxide in the air. The result is acid rain. <laughs> acid rain is strong enough to dissolve some materials in rocks. Once dissolved, the minerals easily wash away, weakening the rock. Acid rain very slowly carves some rocks into different shapes. It gradually erases the lettering on old gravestones and blurs the faces of stone statues. It eats away at the outside of ancient and even modern buildings. Where rain seeps into the ground, carbonic acid causes weathering of buried rocks as well. Over long periods of time, this often unobserved weathering creates caves deep underground. <laughs> Another gas in the air, oxygen, causes chemical weathering in rocks. With a little help from water, oxygen reacts with iron-containing minerals. The reaction changes the minerals, making rocks brittle and crumbly and turning them a rusty red color. Some plants release rock weathering substances. Take a peek under a patch of moss growing on a rock, and you'll see little pits in the rock's surface. Acid from the moss plants caused the damage. As a result of all weathering, Rocks are broken down into smaller pieces and ultimately into sediments. Erosion and what is what gets those sediments moving. Ooh, look at that. Ooh, that must be caused from the rain. <sighs> oh my gosh. Sediments on the move. Geologists describe erosion as any process or force that moves sediments to new locations. Weathering breaks it, erosion takes it. Wind, flowing water, moving ice, and gravity all transport sediments from place to place. These forces are the primary causes of erosion. Have you, have you ever stood on a sandy beach on a windy day? Did you notice that gusts of wind sent sand flying past? When air moves quickly across the ground, it picks up sediments and carries them away. Powerful winds can cause sediments for hundreds, can carry sediments for hundreds, even thousands of miles. 
On the windy beach, did your skin sting as it was struck by blowing sand? Wind carrying sediments can act like a sandblasting machine to wear away rocks in its path. When wind driven sand hits rock, it chips off tiny pieces. The wind then whisks the pieces away. Over time, this form of weathering can polish rock surfaces or pepper them with tiny holes. It can shape huge blocks of rocks into delicate stone arches and lofty towers. Weathering and wind erosion can also leave massive boulders balanced on slim supports. Have you ever seen wind-carved rocks like this? I've been there. Is it Arches National Park in Utah? As wind slows down, the sediments it carries fall back to earth. They are deposited on land or in water. Where winds deposit sediments regularly, layers of sediment slowly build up. Over time, those layers may be transformed into sedimentary rock. I stood right there. That's cool. Yay. Heading downstream. Like wind, water also causes erosion. The tug of gravity pulls sediments out of wind and water. Flowing water picks up sediments and carries them downhill to new location. A summer rain can wash fine sediments onto sidewalks and into gutters. A rushing mountain stream can sweep small stones into a valley. A flooded river can surge along with enough force to move large rocks many miles downstream. As moving water slows, sediments stick to the bottom of the river or stream. The heaviest sediments are the first to be deposited. The finest sediments are the last. Layers of sediment accumulate at the mouths of rivers and on the bottoms of lakes. Vast layers of sediment are also deposited on the ocean floor over long periods of time. Like wind-deposited sediments, those laid down by water may someday be transformed into sedimentary rock. But water doesn't have to be in its liquid state to erode sediments. Glaciers are enormous masses of ice found in polar regions and near the tops of tall mountains. Although ice is solid, glaciers do move. They flow. Valley, valley, slowly. Downhill. As countless tons of ice creep over land or down mountainsides, they push, drag, and carry eroded sediments along. Moving glaciers also create sediments as they grind against rocks below, beside or below them. Glaciers are such powerful forces they can carve huge U-shaped valleys through mountain ranges. When glaciers melt, they deposit the sediments they have been carrying. About 20,000 years ago, glaciers covered large parts of North America, Europe, and Asia. As the climate warmed, the glaciers melted and retreated northward. They left behind massive deposits of sand, gravel, and silt, along with collections of rocks and boulders. You can still see these deposits as hills, mounds, and ridges on the landscape. Next page. Weathering, erosion, and time. Weathering and erosion work slowly. It takes a long time to see their effects. Given time, these processes reshape Earth's surface on a scale so large it's almost impossible to grasp. For example, the Grand Canyon in the southwestern U United States did not exist when dinosaurs roamed North America. Wind, rain, and the Colorado River slowly created it. These forces cut and shaped the landscape into what it is today, one of the world's largest canyons. Millions of years ago, the Appalachian Mountains in eastern North America were a towering mountain range. The highest peaks may have been more than 20,000 feet above sea level. Weathering and erosion gradually wore the Appalachians down. Their highest point today is just 6,684 feet high. As permanent as mountains seem, weathering and erosion inevitably change them. Even Earth's tallest peaks, Everest in Asia, Aconcagua uh, in South America, Africa's Kilimanjaro, and Europe's Mont Blanc won't last. They will eventually be worn down by these endless geological processes. But don't worry! Other geological processes are creating new mountains to take their place. That is crazy to think about. Okay, here we are on page six of our geology books, and we finished reading chapter seven. So, right here, chapter seven. Over time, weathering breaks rocks into smaller pieces, and erosion moves these pieces to new locations. That's the cause, and the evidence we're looking for, what's the evidence of erosion? Um, well, the evidence is the reshaping of Earth's surface. Um, that's what shows us that erosion is a thing. Okay, here we are on page six of our geology book, and we just finished reading chapter seven. And it says, over time, weathering breaks rocks into smaller pieces, and erosion moves these pieces to new locations. So that's what's happening. And the evidence of that is the reshaping of Earth's surface. Shaping of Earth's... I need a capital E for Earth. 
Earth's surface. So we're going to be looking for a picture on page 9 that shows the reshaping of Earth's surface, because that's the evidence of erosion. So let's go to page 9. Okay, so here we are on page 9, and let's zoom in and see we have this side left. So we're looking for any pictures that we saw in chapter 7. So this still looks like seafloor spreading. Glaciers and lakes, mm, getting close. This to me looks like the Grand Canyon, which we talked about in chapter 7. So let's go with that. Oh, and we totally talked about the rock cycle, so we can cross that one out, actually. Nice. So yeah, letter C. So let's go write letter C on page 6. Cool. Okay, so right here we're going to write the letter C. And mm, we're going to see what the riddle's going to be. Okay, <laughs> good job. Um, go ahead and take a picture of page 6. And you should have all of this so far. So keep this if you need it. Okay, bye.